guys, Andy here, and today on a very special episode of Andy Talks Navy, uh, we're going to be going over some very personal um, issues that I went through during my time in the Navy, and I know I said I wasn't going to do any more episodes of Andy Talks Navy and that the series was discontinued and all that, and um, there's still going to be Military Mondays and all that kind of stuff for the older episodes until we run out. But I wanted to make this episode because I posted on my Instagram opening up a bit more about some of the hardships and stuff that I went through uh, when I was stationed overseas in the Navy. And I wanted to to clarify those a bit more than I could with just typing. You know, I said a lot with that, but I wanted to also put it in video form so this one's going to be really hard to get through because it's a lot of emotional baggage and everything. It's um, really hard to to start, but I was looking through some of my old photos and stuff. I have the app TimeHop, which basically goes through uh, some like your old photos and posts and stuff like that from various social media accounts. And I came across one that really kind of got this whole thing started, which was when I had just arrived on Lassen. And it said that I was out on the uh, the forecastle of the ship, which is the, uh, the forward part. I was just out there just trying to get a breather and try to collect myself. And it just brought back a lot of these these old feelings of what I went through when I was out there. And... I shared a little bit with that particular Instagram post and, you know, it just brought me back to that very negative part of my life. It's really hard to, to describe that, that time in my life because, you know, it was literally a tale of two cities. It was the best of times and the worst of times because You know, from 2013, 2015, I was on all counts living the life, right? I just made second. Um, I started getting paid as a second class about a month into my tour out in Yokosuka. So I was actually making some legitimately good money, as it were. You know, when you go up to E5, that's when you see the largest bump up in your quality of life. You know, you start getting BAH if you're not married or an E44 at that point. So I was able to live out in town, lived in a wonderful apartment overlooking Tokyo Bay, um, not too far away from base. So I was able to bicycle out there, saved a lot of money. So that was nice. And again, just on the surface, everything looked great. But I was hiding a lot of internal struggle and I wanted to keep that away from YouTube because, you know, I, I, I saw YouTube and I saw Japan as my escape from the negative stuff that was going on in my life with, with being in the Navy. And I didn't want to bring that onto my platform. I wanted to, to keep them separated. That's why you didn't really see a whole lot of Navy content from me during that time there was a couple little bits here and there like maybe you know like uh command parties and stuff like that but not not a whole lot of military related content um during that time and i was just going through a really rough period during my time on board last and you know again i just made second just transferred to a new ship overseas and was ready for the next stage. I just, I tried to, you know, assume more of that kind of middle management responsibility as a second class, which is what I thought a second class was, at least from my previous command. You start to get some responsibility, because like E5 is is kind of a weird spot to be in, right? Because you're shown as responsible enough to not get the kind of bullshit jobs that a lot of the E4 and junior crowd get. But you're not really senior enough to be totally responsible for a lot of the 
the major stuff. You know, I was kind of in a hard spot to to begin with as far as that goes. And with my particular division, at the time, we only had one work center. And I say this because the main qual that a lot of E5s, you know, go for, especially when they first make E5, is work center supervisor. So you basically you know, learn how to schedule out maintenance and all this other stuff. And you're in some aspects, some divisions might do it a little differently, but in some respects, you're also kind of an assistant LPO. So you kind of help out the LPO leading petty officer, one in charge of the division. You help them out. You know, it's seen as kind of a step up in responsibility as an E5. And when I first got out there, um, the division was, it was very middle heavy you know, there's a lot of second classes there, a lot of very experienced second classes who later became first classes to no surprise because they were just like so on their game. They saw the rank on my shirt, on my uniform, but then they went and, you know, saw how I operated as far as, um, you know, being a leader and being a true second class. And, you know, they just kind of dismissed me. It was uh, it was really hard for me to to get my bearings within that division because we also had uh, when I first arrived we had a uh, very fast tracky type LPO who was just gonna like his main goal in life was to make chief and it didn't matter to him how many people he threw under the bus and how many other people's lives he made miserable to get that goal which he did make. And I've heard he's also made senior chief too. So whatever. Made our lives pretty damn miserable. And at first I kind of shrugged it off because I thought he was just one of those like Joe Navy types where it's like, okay, you know, we got to get stuff done. And it was kind of annoying and a bit of an inconvenience, but I just kind of, you know, just wanted to carry on and not really make waves and stuff. And I was still trying to learn how to be a second class, you know, because like I said, I just made the rank... And when I made the rank on Kurtz, which was my previous command, um, pretty much everybody else ranked up too. So it wasn't like, you know, I was put in charge of a division or was in charge of really anything before I arrived on Lassen. You know, I Lassen, or uh, Kurtz rather, it was my first command. And I did really well in the test, got a good eval because I made it a point to, you know, really fall around uh, the senior tech and like learn as much as I could from him and really, you know, tried to step up, especially at my first command, you know, I want to make a good impression. Right. And a lot of that really helped with my eval and, you know, I got sent cranking later or FSA food service assistant, attendant, whatever. So as far as having actual time doing my job, quote unquote, um, that was only about maybe four months of my time on board. Kurtz was actually dedicated to doing my job as a sonar tech. And I tried to make every minute of that count. And then it got sent crank in and, you know, I had to focus on that. And then when I eventually did go back to the division, we were busy closing down spaces anyway. So it wasn't like we were doing sonar stuff or anything at that point. And uh, once everything was all said and done with the Kurtz, went back to sonar school and uh, went out to Lassen. So I wanted to make a, a good impression on Lassen, but I didn't have any second class experience. And I tried to, to talk to the other second classes who are obviously way more experienced at being a second class and having a leadership role and just try to glean some information from them, but they were very, I don't know, the environment was very, like, ultra competitive. You know, it wasn't like a let's help each other out sort of thing. It was just like a, you know, everybody was kind of vying for a top spot in their eval. And there was very limited ways to do that within our division because, like I said, there's only one work center. And as an E5, main thing you you have to deal with is being a work center soup and one work center, one work center soup. So you have like five or six other second classes running around. And it's like, 
okay, one of them's the work center soup, and then what's everybody else going to do, right? You know, it was it was ultra competitive, which didn't really help because our LPO, uh, you know, pushed us to our limit. Oftentimes when it wasn't really needed, it was just a very stressful environment. And I went through a lot with it. And, you know, when he did pick up chief as a chief select, you know, he kind of fucked off from the rest of the division. And we got another SCG one who came in who was a lot more chill, a lot more even keeled. He was one of those like gold Chevron first classes. So he's he's been around the block for a while. So he was a lot more even keeled than the uh, the previous LPO. So it was kind of a, a nice change of pace. And uh, it was almost like getting through like shell shock or something once he came in. And then you got a couple other first classes that were coming in as well who were a lot more friendly. And it was just like, it's like I, w- I woke from this really horrible dream. It's just like, this this is how a division is supposed to be run, right? You know, I didn't, like, imagine some kind of crazy scenario where we all actually work together instead of being at each other's throats for fucking eval points to make first. I just felt like I was in a no-win situation. So I basically just kind of divested myself as much as I could from the division and being a true second class and just accepted a lot of roles that it would put me outside of, of the division. So, you know, whether it was something as low as, you know, like being birthing cleaners or, you know, something like that, I was, I was always the first to volunteer for birthing cleaners. So I wouldn't have to deal with a lot of the bullshit of the division. I could just kind of, you know, separate myself from them and also give opportunities to, to other junior sailors, you know, the E4 and below crowd, to step up and, you know, get some good eval points, which they did. A couple of them, a lot of them actually, made second. And, you know, when they transferred out of the commands, they had some really good good stuff on their eval, a lot of good quals and things like that. You know, I'd like to think at least in some small way I helped play a part in that, even though it was a bit indirectly. You know, I just I felt like if I couldn't, you know, change the division or at least help support the division directly, then I just needed to to get away from it. And thankfully, my chief sent me to ER09, uh, the DCPO, you know, going TAD with that. You know, he originally approached it as kind of like this solemn, like, well, we're sending you TAD and it may not be what you want and all this kind of stuff. And really like, you know, I was so glad that he sent me TAD because I was, I was just dying a death in, in my division. You know, I just felt like I was just kind of there basically. And it felt like any time I tried to step up, I would just get stomped down by either the senior second classes or other first classes. And it's like, you know, okay, so that's not the right way. So, like, I'm trying to, like, get some leadership information from them. But they're like, you're a second class, fucking figure it out. You know, and that's not the right way to lead. That's just petty and just, like, we're going to, you know, punish you for your mistakes, but we're not going to tell you what's the right way to do things. You just are expected to know because you have the two chevrons. I was just miserable, but... Once I went to ER9, things started improving because I actually, you know, was held accountable for some things. You know, I had some responsibility, had maintenance that literally had my name on it. So I had to go out and do stuff. And it wasn't like anything super taxing or whatever, but it was just like a lot of little things. And plus just simply having, you know, a set responsibility to do and not have to deal with the politics and bullshit of the division. I could actually do my job. You know, and yeah, there was some kind of bullshit that went on with uh, with the division as well as engineering department because it's, you know, it's it's a rough department to be in. I'll be honest. I have a lot of respect for engineering department. Absolutely. It kind of sucked, you know, staying later and seeing all the guys from my main division get out, you know, around supper time and I have to stay a little bit later because, you know, I got some maintenance to do and. 
you know, got the spot check to do or got to clear some stuff up. And, you know, Chang doesn't want to let us go until 20 hundred or something like that. Yeah, you know, I'll admit it hurt, but uh, it felt a lot better to actually be part of something that it, I felt like I was actually doing something and making a difference. You know, I was getting a lot of face time with the uh, the top chain of commands. You know, every division you have um, spot checks, and ERO nine has loads of spot checks to do, and you know, there's always like a a weekly CO XO CMC inspection and usually they would have me do the co inspections especially you know did did some good things that was around the time we also the ship went through inserve which is the largest uh ship-wide inspection so we got to make sure everything's in tip-top shape uh not just cosmetically but also like working shape engineering department has a lot of things that they got to worry about as far as that goes yeah, we definitely had our hands full. A lot of 0400 to 2000 days. In doing all this and in between all this, a lot of stress and everything was building up. You know, I was not taking care of myself. Absolutely not. I was drinking every day, like every day. And it was the only way I could like sleep at night. Or at least, like, pass out. Was to drink every night. It was the only way I could, like, calm myself down from all the, all the stress and the anxiety and trying to be as, as on as possible. And, you know, I'd drink a whole bunch of coffee in the mornings so I could be as up and, like, on it as possible. And also kind of pass through the hangover and stuff. That's just not good to do long term. No, nah, that shit fucking wears on you and just exacerbates a lot of the sim- symptoms, makes things a lot worse. You know, I wasn't getting proper sleep. I was going through a lot of stress and anxiety and depression, and I felt like I was trapped in that situation. And I wanted to to seek help because I was having... Um, I was having suicidal thoughts, actually. I lived on the, the sixth floor of my apartment building. It seemed like every time I walked to go turn to my door to like open it up, there was a little clearing on the other side. And you know, I'd take pictures from there often of uh, Mount Fuji off in the distance on a clear day. You can see it. And you can see like uh, Tokyo Bay and all kinds of other stuff. Every time I would walk, walk past it, I would always hear this little voice in my head saying, jump. You know, I'd have to, like, fight myself to to not jump. To say, that's, what the fuck? That's a weird idea. Or just kind of brush it off as, oh, I'm, I'm just kind of stressed. You know, if I just go inside, have, some, have something to drink, you know, I'll, I'll calm down. I'll be, I'll be fine. It's just, it's just the, the stress of the day talking, you know. And you know, things just uh, started getting worse. You know, I was getting little to no sleep, even in port, which is when you should be getting proper sleep. You know, underway, it kind of is what it is. But, uh, you know, in in port, there's largely no excuse. And the Navy's not like a like a job where, okay, if, if this job's making you miserable, at the end of the day, you can always go out and look for a new job. And once you get that lined up, put your two weeks in and, you know, deuce out. You know, the Navy's got you, man. I wanted to, to seek help, but there was somebody else within my, uh, my division who um, tried to seek help. And um, I don't know all the circumstances behind his particular situation. I just didn't like the way he was treated. He was just seen as kind of a burden to the division. I saw, like, getting help in that way as punishment and as exposing yourself as a liability to the division and to the readiness of the ship. And just the way he was, he was treated really discouraged me from, you know, seeking help. And keep in mind, like, every day, you know, I was, I was drinking every day and having all these thoughts of wanting to jump off my fucking 
apartment six floors up to kill myself or at least like break my legs so I wouldn't have to go on the ship anymore. I remember um, one of my friends when I was TAD, um, he accidentally broke his leg when he fell down a flight of stairs when he was getting ready to, to go to work. And he was off the ship for about three weeks. And I just remember thinking, like, how how lucky he was. And it wasn't just like a quick little, oh, lucky. You know, it was just like an intense kind of serious, like, that lucky bastard. And, you know, I kind of look at the, the metal staircase going down my apartment being like, I wonder, like, how far I could fall and, like, hurt myself to break my leg so I wouldn't have to go to work anymore. It was getting to be some serious shit, you know, and I just had to stop myself and be like, what the fuck is going on? Why am I thinking like this? Because I, I never thought like this before. You know, I've gone through some tough times before and, you know, I've been sad and everything, but this is like a whole nother level. I did end up seeking help when I went to AD because um, I had an LPO there who was just like, what a true first class LPO should be, just very caring of his division and just, you know, always doing the right thing. And we didn't always agree on everything, but uh, I really respect the guy, you know. And I mean, we had a good enough understanding to where I could talk to him in private and be like, hey, I gotta go to Fleet and Family. And. You know, I went out to there. I even went out to see the chaplain. And I'm not religious at all. But I, I just needed to seek some kind of outside help. Somebody outside of the chain of command. At least somebody to talk to. To see, like, am I crazy? Is this, like, not how it should be? Like, what's going on here? You know, because I felt like the only sane person in an insane asylum, you know, and I was talking to Fleet and Family because they'd have like uh, counselors and stuff like that. And it helped a little, you know, it helped relieve a lot of the tension in the immediate moment. But it didn't really give me anything to actively deal with all the all the oncoming stress. You know, it was just, if anything, just a platform for me to vent my frustrations of the day or the week or whenever we would meet. But it wasn't actually solving my problem. And I just felt like, you know, I was just in this unwinnable situation. Wasn't able to to solve my problems. Problems were only getting worse. I noticed my own mental state deteriorate. And meanwhile, while I'm going through all this, this misery, I'm living in the country that I've wanted to live in since I was a little kid. Rent free, I might add living in an amazing apartment overlooking the ocean on the surface, just living the life, you know? And I remember, you know, some of my friends came over one day and it's just like, you know, how could you possibly be depressed living in such an awesome place, man? You know, you got the ocean breeze and you don't even have to pay for this place and all this other stuff. And I'm just like, if, if only you knew, if only you knew. And, uh, you know, I wanted so desperately to focus on the positive and to not, especially didn't want to worry my mom because I knew that, you know, she watches my videos and reads all my posts and stuff like that. And, you know, I'm several thousand miles away from where she's at. So I didn't want her to worry, you know, any more about my mental state or anything like that. You know, it's it's hard enough being that far away from her but you know if you're not in a good place then that that just makes it worse and i really didn't want her to worry so you know i just put on the brave face said it was fine said everything was good and uh i lied i lied and uh, when i would come home on leave the the tension kind of dropped i could feel it drop because i didn't have to deal with all that stress and anger, and frustration. I could just kind of be here in the moment, meet up with my friends and go back to areas of familiarity, 
and feel like, you know, this is kind of what my life used to be like. But when I would go back to work, it, you know, all of it would just kind of come rushing back in. I guess the best way I could describe it was everything leading up to the point of me having to get up and go to work or even go to bed so the next morning I could get up to go to work. You know, I felt like it was normal or just kind of happy, you know. And then once I had to get ready to go to bed, that's when a lot of the thoughts started coming in. A lot of the anxiety of what am I going to have to deal with when I get to work tomorrow? What did I forget? What did somebody from the division forget? What did somebody from the ship do? Did something happen? What's going on? And a lot of this really, you know played a part in just a lot of bad self-medication and so the only thing I could do was drink and I'm also a stress eater too so the only thing I do is just drink and eat like really bad food for me like I eat McDonald's almost every day gained a shit ton of weight no surprise from you know not doing anything like even I look back at you know the Andy Japan series and you know I love the videos but I look back on the last little bit of like 2014, very early 2015. I didn't really do a whole lot. And, you know, I didn't really leave the house as much. You know, that's when I started exploring more of local area, you know, because I was just depressed and just burnt out. And it was starting to show in my videos. I mean, it was very subtle, but, you know, I could see it. Came to a point where went in for PFA, physical uh, fitness assessment. You know, I failed the uh, the weigh-in and the, the rope and choke, too. You know, once once I got the results back and everything, um, apparently, because I'd failed once back in 2011, and then I'd failed again. The one from 2011 was set to drop off, like, maybe a couple days after the initial assessment. So they were willing to drop that past failure if I were to sign up on FEP and, you know, do all this stuff to lose the weight because at the time uh, the PFA instruction had changed to allow for some past failures to be scrubbed. I had, a, you know, a talk with my chief about it. Or he talked to me about it. And he, he presented the option of wanting to stay in, you know, just have one of my failures scrubbed, go to FEP, lose the weight, you know, get retaped and, uh, you know, carry on. I just decided I can't do this anymore. Like, there's a reason that I gained all this weight, you know. And obviously it's what I fucking put in my mouth. But that was caused by a lot of stress from what I was doing in the Navy. And I felt like even if I were to, to lose the weight or just suck it in, it would not help you know, alleviate these problems, which are only getting worse. Hearing all these suicidal ideations and stuff going on in my head, you know, I, I just couldn't take it anymore. So I just decided, you know, I'm, I think it's time. It's probably best I just separate. I, I just can't take it anymore being here. I'm unhappy. There's a reason that I gained so much freaking weight. I'd rather be fat and alive than skinny and dead. A lot easier to lose weight when you're alive than it is when you're dead. Once I told them, told my divo about it, they were like, okay, you know, we'll start processing you out. Began the, uh, the process to process out, which took several months to do. But, you know, I remember that day very vividly. Everybody was kind of approaching it as sort of this like tragic sort of like moment. You know, it's like, well, he, he's getting kicked out. And it's it's so sad to see someone, like, cut down in the prime of their Navy career and stuff like that. But really, it was the best thing that could ever have happened to me. And I can honestly say it, it saved my life. You know, as, as ironic as it may sound, I, I got out for my own health and because of my health. But I remember that day... Once I told everybody what I wanted to do and uh, they were kind of solemn about it. But for me internally, I felt like a weight had been lifted from me and I felt like, 
you know, I, I could breathe again. And that's when, you know, the metaphorical clouds parted and the sun came in and all this other stuff. And it just, I felt like, you know, there was a light at the end of the tunnel and it wasn't all doom and gloom. And it's like, you know, remember you're here for uh, forever. You know, there's life outside of, of the military, you know, did my thing for the rest of my time out there. You know, I made a lot of great videos, did the out processing thing, got all signed up for uh, post 9-11 benefits and everything. Got accepted to a school out in Michigan. By the time I actually got out, I had a substantial amount of money and savings. That was both the roughest and the best time in my life because, again, I was in Japan. I was in the country I wanted to be in since I was a kid. But I also had this incredibly stressful job that was pushing me to want to end my life. I didn't want to post that on YouTube or Facebook or any other stuff because A, I didn't want to make my folks worried. And B, I didn't want the chain of command to find out and have me like committed or something like that, you know, have me on like suicide watch or whatever. And, you know, just be treated as like a prisoner, you know, as a, as a liability to the division. You know, I've been out for going on four years now, back in school, as you guys know, been following me for a while. And things are actually going really good with that, by the way. I'm going to do another separate update video for that. Yeah, man, there is life outside the military, and there is a real light at the end of the tunnel. And I'm so glad to hear that, while not everywhere in the military, you know, they are starting to slowly take mental health very seriously for active duty personnel. And it's becoming more and more okay to, to seek help for your problems and not be ostracized by your chain of command. I'm so thankful for that. To be able to, to save lives, you know, to be able to turn around careers, that's tremendous. And I hope that the military moves forward with that. As for me, since getting out, I haven't had any suicidal thoughts. Uh, don't get me wrong, I have gone through a lot of really bad anxiety and depressive episodes. And while everything hasn't worked out exactly as I planned, I had a lot of ups and downs since getting out. But I gotta say, getting out was the best decision I ever made. Despite everything that happened with me in the Navy, um, joining when I did was the best decision I'd made because at the time I was really going nowhere in life. And, you know, if anything, the Navy took me out of Mercer County, Ohio, and allowed me to see the world and to finally see Japan, the place I'd wanted to go to. And it also taught me a lot about adversity, you know, despite all the traumatic experience that I went through overseas. It, it is a part of me. It will always be a part of me. Overall, it has made me a much stronger person. And I want to continue to, to build on that person. I feel like I've changed a lot since then. And I go back a lot of times. I go back and watch my old videos and kind of see how I carry myself and what I sound like, what I even look like, and stuff like that. You can see it in the body language. I, I feel like a completely d different person than I was back in 2014, 2015, and for the better. Maybe not physically weight-wise, because, you know, <laughs> I gained another 30 pounds since coming back to the States, because, you know, depression and drive through will, uh, will do that to you. Mentally, overall, I'm in a, in a much better place, and I'm actually working towards a goal that is my own, and that is to come back to Japan on my own terms and to study abroad in Tokyo, to make the videos that I want to make, and to continue to do what I love doing, which is YouTube, and taking photographs on Instagram as well. Those are the things that, that literally kept me going. Those are like the only things that kept me going, even during that really shitty time in my life when I was at my absolute lowest and literally wanted to kill myself, like YouTube, and making pictures on Instagram were the only things that were keeping me going and giving me some form of, of positivity in my life. You know, I'd always say that no matter how bad it is, at least at the end of the workday, I can focus on editing a new video or uh, 
you know, thinking about a new place to go to, just kind of looking to see what my friends are up to. Oh, you know, I want to make a video about this place or talk about this place or talk about this thing or, or whatever, you know. And that's what kept me going through all this. Um, but I just want to thank you for tuning in. If you tuned in this far into the video, I want to thank you especially. Still have my issues. You know, I still have a lot of, uh, like, anxiety and things like that. Depressive episodes kind of come and go out of nowhere, it seems. Uh, but I'm doing my best to, to handle those, those situations. And I feel like I have a lot better tools in my toolkit to, to do that. Hey, man, I think it's going to do it for this video. Uh, I've rambled and raved long enough. Uh, so once again, thank you guys so much for, for all the support and for giving me a purpose in life. You know, whether it's just you watching these videos, liking or commenting or uh, hitting the stars for you old school followers. Been on the platform since 2006. So I've seen it all, baby. And I uh, just want to thank you guys so much for, for sticking around. And the best is yet to come. Just want to say thanks so much. And with that said, this is Andy San. Sign for now. Here at Andy Talks Navy HQ, I guess, since this is kind of a one-time deal or whatever. I might make more Andy Talks Navy videos in the future, but for now, it's just kind of a whenever sort of thing. So aside from the military Mondays until they run out, don't expect new episodes of Andy Talks Navy. This is just kind of a special one-time deal. So anyway, round on long enough. So with that said... This is Andy Sean. Sign for now. As always, we'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye.